Welcome to the Big Bass Podcast, the fishing show where size matters. I'm Ken Duke. And I'm Terry Battisti. Our producer and engineer is Nathan, or as we call him, Natty Ben Ben, Benson. This episode of the Big Bass Podcast is a follow-up to the show that we posted on uh, November 21st uh, last year that we called the best trophy bass lure ever. It was about the Arbogast musky jitterbug, and it was a fun show. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it, but we feel that we could have done a little bit better job slamming the door on the subject. So we're back to talk about the musky jitterbug again, one of the all-time great topwater lures and arguably the greatest big bass lure of all time. This time, we are quite literally covering the subject from A to Z, Terry, from Arbogast mm -hmm. to Zinker. Our guest is the world's <laughs> foremost expert on fishing and modifying the musky jitterbug. We'll introduce him in just a moment. First, so we're going to hit some uh, highlights on the history of the musky jitterbug and the jitterbug lure family. Uh, if you want a little bit more detail, go back and check out the earlier episode. Here, we're all about helping you use the, the greatest big bass lure of all time to catch giant fish of your own. Yeah, here's the jitterbug story in a nutshell. Uh, Fred Arbogast of Akron, Ohio, was one of America's great lure designers and manufacturers. In the late 1920s, he wanted to compete with some diving baits that were being made by Hedden. His prototype wasn't very successful, so he stuck it in a drawer. A decade or so later, a friend named Brooke Ortel was visiting and saw the lure. They went back to work on it, repositioned the diving lip, turned it into a topwater bait, the jitterbug. It was named for the dance style that was all the rage around that time. And so Arbogast begins manufacturing the jitterbug in 1938. And over the next few years, he obtained several patents on the bait. Uh, the baits were made of uh, aromatic cedar and were the only wooden baits mass produced by the company. Uh, until 1940, it was the only, uh, only available in a 5 8 ounce size. It was two and three quarter inches long. Uh, and in 1940, they began manufacturing a three-eighths ounce version known as the peanut in a one and a half ounce version that was four and a half inches long that was known as the musky jitterbug. Yeah, the first musky jitterbugs had two hooked and came in only three colors, perch, red and white, and black back and silver scale. It sold for a buck fifty. Shortly thereafter, Arbogast came out with a classic three hook version with one big treble just below the back end of the lure and one more on each side. Along the way, the jitterbug earned a reputation as a great night fishing lure. But the musky jitterbug was discontinued in August of 1942, and it wasn't reintroduced until about five years later. Part of the reason uh, for that was that it was difficult to get materials uh, like the hooks and the hook hangers and screws uh, during World War II. Uh, by the time those materials became readily available again and Arbogast resumed uh, production of the musky jitterbug, all the regular sized jitterbugs had been converted to plastic. But they still made the musky jitterbug out of wood until 1980. Today, Arbogast still makes the musky jitterbug, but they don't call it that anymore. Officially, it's the Model 700 jitterbug, and it's made out of plastic instead of wood. It weighs about a quarter ounce less than the old wooden musky jitterbugs, and it's a fine lure that catches big fish. But it's not the classic bait, and it's not the lure recommended by our expert, as you'll see. Yeah, and, and the jitterbug was an immediate hit. I mean, from the day that it was put out on the market. Uh, and according to experts, Arbogast has sold somewhere between 20 and 100 million uh, of them over the decades. Now, I mean, that's a pretty wide spread. You know, okay. why was, you know, <laughs> 80, 80 million baits in between. But uh, of course, you know, only a small percentage of those were the musky version. And a primary reason the jitterbug was so commercially successful was that it caught big fish. Yeah, Field and Stream magazine had a fishing contest that ran from 1911 to the late 1970s, and the jitterbug won more awards in the bass categories, largemouth, smallmouth, and spotted, than any other lure, by far. Yeah, and it, and it also produced uh, more state record bass than any other lure. In fact, uh, there are still four state record largemouth records in the books that were caught on the jitterbug, uh, those states being Connecticut, New Hampshire, Ohio, and Rhode Island. 
And before you start thinking they were all taken when your great grandfather was fishing, <laughs> know that the Rhode Island record was caught in 2016. And those four records don't include nearly all the state records that were taken on the jitterbug through the years. Those are just the ones that are still the state records. Exactly. And kind of what we covered last uh, uh, show and it, that we, that we uh, did in November uh, was about a guy uh, that in the 1970s and 80s, an Alabama angler by the name of L.J. Brasher uh, and outdoor writer John E. Phillips helped to keep the musky jitterbug in the spotlight uh, with stories in the major fishing and outdoors magazines. Brasher caught between a 500 and a 1,000 double-digit largemouths in North Florida, South Georgia, and Alabama. L.J. Brasher died in 1997, but not before inspiring our guest to follow in his footsteps, chasing giant bass, chasing giant bass with the musky jitterbug. Let's bring him on now. Jimmy Zinker, welcome to the Big Bass Podcast. Good evening. Welcome, Jimmy. Nice to see you. Thanks Good very much for too, joining sir. us. Jimmy, one of the things I, I really enjoyed learning about you, I always appreciate the folks who appreciate history. And yes, uh, you're you're absolutely a protege of L.J. Brasher. How did you find out about L.J. Brasher and the musky jitterbug? Um, 1985. I had read an article uh, where in this article it was the fellow doing the writing, I guess, mentioned that he was camping. And in the middle of the night, on a full moon, he walked down to the boat ramp with a, a jitterbug on a, a rod and reel and threw it, caught a 12-pound bass. Mm. <laughs> and um, in 1985, I was, uh, at the time, 20 years old. And I've been bass fishing since I was six years old. And any mention of a 12-pound bass is going to, you know, get my attention. Yeah. I mentioned to a friend of mine that I would uh, I would love to learn to do that fish at night that I'd understood that big fish can be caught at night. And he said, I've got a Bassmaster magazine with an article for you. And he he gave me the year compilation of 1980 Bassmaster magazine in a hardback cover that he had gotten as a lifetime member of BASS. And uh, January 1980 was the article about L.J. Brasher. Yep. <laughs> and I read it, and I considered it a um, an educational course. And long story short, the first night I went out, I had no jitterbug, so I used a devil's horse, and I caught a 9-2. And wow. I've been ruined on it ever since. Um, with the exception of about 10 years, I actually all but quit fishing because I got so heavily into metal detecting. But speaking of history... <laughs> But I found my way back into this, and um, it's like an addict relapsing. You know, you're addicted to something, and you get out of it, and then you find yourself back on it. And I don't see myself ever quitting it again. Mm -hmm. um, you know, let me just say, I'm no L.J. Brasher. I have not caught hundreds of 10-pound bass. But what I have done is I have caught, over the course of almost 40 years, more seven, eight, nine, nine and three-quarter pound bass than I can remember. Wow. Um, I've, I've, I could have probably have done better if I would have uh, changed my approach up, fish different places. It wasn't the tactic. It's me. I've seen enough that I can tell you this tactic works. It's very effective. Um, 2023, I caught 17 bass, seven pounds or bigger between seven and eight and eight pounds, 13 ounces was my biggest for that year and a good number of those fish were caught on musky jitterbugs sounds like you keep records kind of like lj brasher kept records of his catches yes i have a log book at home i started that back up in 2023 that's fantastic now you never had a chance to meet brasher but you're obviously a a, a real fan of what he did and, and how he did it yes sir i am an absolute fan of him i always considered him a mentor and i always dreamed of the day that i could meet him and with the onset of Google and the internet, um, which is Johnny come lately to my life, I'm 59 years old. And one day I was sitting at the house and I thought, you know, I bet I can use this thing to find LJ Brasher. <laughs> what I found was that he had passed away, unfortunately. Oh, yeah, he died in, in 1997, right. which is un unfortunate, but uh, thanks right to John Right at the birth Phil of the internet. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Thanks to John Phillips. Uh, we have a, a pretty good record of Brasher, his accomplishments and his methods. 
Jimmy, you mentioned uh, uh, one of your first big fish at night came on a, a, a Smithwick Devil's horse. When did you first get your hands on a musky jitterbug? The next day, actually. And in 1985, they didn't sell these things real heavily down in the south down here. And um, we didn't have eBay at the time. So what I did no. was I got handsaw and I went out to my granddaddy's cedar tree in the backyard and I cut a limb out of a cedar tree and I made one. <laughs> And how did you make the bill? How did you make the lip? Um, bought a uh, bought a plastic one and took hardware off of it. Oh, okay. Yep. Yep. It was so. Um, go ahead. It, 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 it was basically a jitterbug. I'm, I bought a plastic one. I, I used the um, um, the plastic body to copy and form my uh, my wooden body. And what I do is I start out whittling with a knife, and then I switch over to sandpaper and i use 80 grit sandpaper to shape the body and get the angle of the lip like i want it and then i just would use the same hardware and mount everything up i caught some massive fish with that with that lure and and five or six i made after and were you exclusively a night fisherman at that point in time well no i've never really been exclusively a night fisherman at that point in time i um was a not exclusively a jitterbug at night fisherman uh -huh. and um somewhere along the way a, a bit later i discovered i can catch them in the daytime too with that lure okay now you, you we talk about your having lj brasher as a as a mentor um do you also use his absolutely punishing and relentless fishing style of going 72 hours straight i can't do that i typically take it one night at a time if i go two nights in a row then i have to go home and take a nap or go sleep in the truck amen um, I said, amen. do what I, I said amen i i, I don't know how brasher got away with it of course at my age i, I wouldn't even consider yeah typically night. what i do on the way to the lake, I, I want to get out on the lake about sunset, and I'll fish till sun up. And on the way, dry, on the drive, I'll ju I'll typically drink two cup of coffee, and I'll have um, at least one, usually two or three Red Bulls in my cooler, and drink <laughs> them during the night. It's a grueling way to fish. Uh, Ninety percent of the people I've taken with me as a guest over the years to show this to, it, a good ninety percent of them never come back for a second night. <laughs> <laughs> You're thinning the herd, man. I like it. Exactly. Thin that herd, Jimmy. Thin them out. Hey, I caught a nine and three quarter one night with a guy in the boat with me that I had along as my guest, and he ain't ever come back. <laughs> well, that, that's pretty so, sad. Are Are you finding that there is this specific thirty minute window uh, that is consistent with producing, you know, the big fish that you're catching, like Brasher did? I catch them throughout the night. It varies. What I do prefer is dark. I don't, you know, I, some of the biggest fish I've caught at night, I've caught on full moon, but it tends oh, wow. to be the exception and not the rule. It's it very much seems to do better when it's totally dark and very calm. Yep. Well, let's talk for a minute about the, about the jitterbug itself. Um, you know, we made a lot in the introduction about the wood versus plastic stuff. And um, uh, Brasher only used the wooden musky jitterbugs. What about you, Jimmy? I just used the wooden. And, and how hard is it to find, since they really haven't made the wooden musky jitterbug for uh, at least 30-some-odd years, um, yeah. how hard is it for you to find original wooden musky jitterbugs made of cedar? Yeah, not hard at all to find them now since the onset of the internet. Um, they're on eBay all the time. They can get a little pricey. Yep. Um, tip, you know, they're very collectible. I typically will not buy, which the, the price doesn't usually justify it, but out of respect for those that collect, I don't buy the rare ones and destroy them because I tell you what, two months with me and that lures trash. Here's one right here. Yeah, hold that one up for us if you can. Holy mackerel. <laughs> Yep. Now, well, you say it's trash. Now, you've worn it out on, on big fish there, but yes. but after you make your modifications, which we're going to go into in just a little bit here, after you make your modifications, I'm guessing that those baits no longer have real collectible value. Is that is that no. a fair statement? Yeah, no, probably not because I'm drilling extra holes in them and putting heavier yeah. hardware and bending the lip all up. And... Yeah. Yeah, I was at the uh, NFLCC show in Pigeon Forge 
uh, here a couple of weeks ago. And there was four of them. I ended up buying one of them for 20 bucks uh, because it was a user. It was not a collector. Uh, yes, the other three were collectors and they wanted, you know, 80 to $120 for oh, yeah. each of those. So I've paid $120 for them to fish with. Well, <laughs> every one of them you've got for $20 a piece. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What the one that I ended up getting was, uh, Probably, you know, a, a mid 1970s to 1980 version based upon the packaging. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a frog pattern. And it, the box was all destroyed. And the bait itself had a bunch of nicks and stuff on it. It had never been fished, but it it had seen better days. So, yes, sir. Yep. Yeah, at present, I have probably in the neighborhood of 70 of them. Mm. Oh, wow. Yeah, I've looked at your Facebook page. There's <laughs> some of them laying on your table. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm serious about it. And, and, and like I told Ken, um, I'm, I'm chewing my fingernails off right now because here in about, you know, two, three, four weeks, it's going to start up. Oh, wow. And yeah, I, I want to get into your, I want to get into your fifth fishing methods in just a little bit here. But but one of the things I want to mention in talking about that wood plastic thing, um, I recently sent jimmy some bait some I, I sent him three musky jitterbugs and asked him to to do his thing on them i asked him to to take two of them and and make them the way he thinks is best and i asked him if he would take one of those baits and 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 make it the way lj brasher uh recommended and did and he was kind enough to do that and i'm excited about these baits and excited about the chance to fish them but jimmy found out something really interesting about the composition of my baits and, and Jimmy, I, I was expecting that these were that aromatic cedar, yep. but that's not what you discovered. Was it? No, sir. They're, they're not cedar They're They smell like maybe pop poplar or some piece of wood like that, but they are not cedar wood. And that's disappointing to me, Terry. I hate that. Interesting. Yeah. Well, well the good action and I was able to change the hardware out. Like I can't do with a, a plastic body and I still, I think you'll do well with them. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to fishing them anyway, but, but, uh, you know, you, you hear, I, especially, uh, gearing up for this show, gearing up for something else. I want to tell our audience about in a little bit that you and I are working on Jimmy. Um, I was, I was thinking, all right, aromatic cedar, we're in business. This is, this is the deal. And, and to find out that they, at some point in the process, they were making them out of something other than the cedar was a little bit disappointing to me. Mm -hmm. And I think that was in the nineties that they, they came out with a wood musky jitterbug for some commemorative thing, uh, like in 97 or for some reason that year pops into my head. Uh, and it maybe they used poplar at that point uh, yeah. instead of aromatic cedar. I don't know. Um, but you know, the, the thing about the poplar, the only thing I could see about the poplar is that it's not going to absorb water like cedar did. And I know, I know Brasher would soak his baits in water before he would go fishing. So they weighed more and, and, and chugged, you know, a little deeper or something. Yep. Is that right, Jimmy? Yep. That's, that's actually, I've gotten that, so to speak from the horse's mouth, you know, LJ had a brother named Lindell. Lynn, yes. Named Lynn. I'm sorry, Lynn. And, um, I never knew about Lynn until I had a chance meeting on Facebook with Lynn's son would be LJ's nephew. And I was um, very thrilled and um, excited to have a phone conversation with him. And in that conversation, he told me he always knew when his daddy was going fishing because the bathtub was full of jitterbugs. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I like that. Now let's talk a little bit about the modifications that you like to make on the bait because, um, that's fascinating to me. And, and, you know, we talk about the jitterbug being the best big bass lure of all time, but you found a way to make absolutely objective improvements on this lure. Yes, sir. Objective improvements without question, in my opinion. Now, Brasher was taken and he was using longer screw eyes to hold the hooks and the face plate in, in place. He was crimping the face plate to give it a different look and sound uh, yep. He was replacing the original hooks. He he relocated the face plate and slid it down the face of the bait a little bit. And he also moved the back hook to the absolute tail of yes, the lure. Right. 
rather than on the keeping it on the underside. What modifications do you make, Jimmy? Um, I started using the um, they're they're made by Hillman. You can buy them at Lowe's. Um, number two by half inch long brass wood screws. They are a little bit bigger in diameter. They go in a little deeper and get a little more bite. The factory screws, I have gotten them there from anywhere from, I think, just over a 16th inch up to a half inch. But the half inch versions are even smaller diameter. Most of the screws I've pulled out of the lures from the factory are really, really short. And in years past, you know, an improvement is always um, facilitated by a problem. Yep. And in the past, I have had bass literally tear the hooks out of these lures. Mm-hmm. And the way I fish them at night and the way LJ did it, LJ did it with um, very stiff rods, heavy reels, um, 50 pound test braided line. I use anywhere from 65 to 100 pound. And you've got to fish these things in real heavy cover vegetation. So when that bass hits, as soon as she blows up on it, you have got to start winching her out of that vegetation. You let her get her head down, you're probably not going to get her or your lure back in the boat. Wow. So that puts stress on the um, on the jitterbug itself. Like when you take a stock engine and use it as a race engine, it's, it stresses the motor. You're going to tear the motor up. Same thing with the jitterbug. So how do you correct that problem with the motor? You put stronger components in it. That's what mm-hmm. I've done with the jitterbug. And um, with the with just the hook hangers on the side, the, the hooks tend to bind up. And I was losing a lot of fish. I'd have them come up and throw the lure. So I added the slip rings, and I use anywhere from 50 to 80-pound slip rings on the side. There you go. Those are black, so those right there are 88-pound slip rings. Wow. Uh, they'll hold her. But what they do is they keep that lure from, from binding up when she's up out of the water throw trying to throw that lure that lure is actually able to move around and it's a lot tougher for her to throw it i have a lot better hook up and catch ratio since i made that change with the slip rings and that's also i believe lj's reason for moving that rear hook to the very rear tip better hook right so uh my question is is what size drill do you use to uh drill out your pilot holes for the screws because you know the the drill bit that I'm using. I'm has I've had so long I can't remember the fractional size to it. Okay. Um, <laughs> literally several years, but it's a it's a very small one. You want it, You want your screws. So get you a two by four and and do test holes until you get the right one with the screws you're you're using for your lure. You uh-huh. want the screw to go in, but and have a good snug grab. But right. you don't want it to bind up so much that you break that brass screw off in your lure, and that will happen. Uh, what about epoxy? Are you putting epoxy down in the hole to add, add to, you know, its ability to grab or no, sir, because I want to be able to take the lure apart and do repaints about once a year. Okay. All right. And up until this year, I always just rattle can them black again, but now I've gone and bought a, uh, airbrush system and I'm actually putting real paint jobs on them now. Uh-huh. Um, I don't think the fish will care, but I'm enjoying it. <laughs> one right there. I mean, maybe you can send us a picture of that bait, so we'll put that it. Looks we'll, good. We'll put it up during the during the show because we've got oh, we'll do it. production work we do. But yeah, hey man, adding an level of level of our artistry to yes, uh, the, the the practical modifications. Now, like Brasher, I know you you bend the faceplate. What is it that you do differently from Brasher with regard to the faceplate? Any anything? Um. I don't think Brasher um, bent the top up there where the line is tied to each side of that line tie. You see where it's slightly bent down. That's something I picked up on. I don't think that he did that, but I've seen several pictures of LJ's jitterbugs, and they were bent differently. And if you look at a lot of pictures of mine taken at different times, you will see that I do that also. I'm always experimenting with different things. But what I want, when I'm pulling that, um, jitterbug at night at a slow moderate speed I want it to have a, a, a real distinct plop 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 and if you can see it in the light when it's got that action you want it to be spraying water out to the sides I'm sorry hit my mic but with, with every pop 
Yeah, I can see how they would do that because you're kind of forcing the water out the side. You're almost channeling yep. it to yep. make mm -hmm. it splash like that. Yep, now, you're giving it a shot of escape. I, I love what you do with the line tie because the, the traditional standard line tie on, I guess, like a rivet. Bugs, yeah, it's like a rivet. What's holding it in is like the head of a small nail. And yes, that always right. looked pretty shaky to me. Yes. You're adding a big, heavy split ring in there. And I think that's a much better system. It is. Yep. Um, I have had the uh, the studs to pull out over time. It's a wearing part. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. like the ball joints on your truck. You don't realize it's wearing. And when you need it the most, it'll let you, do, it'll let you down. Every single time. <laughs> now, another thing you do, like Brasher, but with, with different components, is you replace the original hooks. Yes, sir. And you've got a uh, mean-looking hook, right? They here. are very mean hooks. You don't want those in your hand. So, what um, hook is that, Jimmy? That is the Laser Sharp 4X um, two alt treble hooks. Wow! Okay. That's the box they come in. I buy them from from uh, Bass Pro in Tallahassee, uh -huh. Florida, um, or you can order them off the web. Mm -hmm. We we talked about uh, well we talked about the split rings that you've got going on. It's a it's a very impressive set of modifications you make. Yes, and sir. and I, I will I want to mention this a couple of times during the show because I I think it's important. You've modified a lot of baits for a lot of people, and uh, you're willing to accept a certain number of of clients. Let's call them. I guess for, for anybody who has a musky jitterbug out there and they would like to have it modified uh, to fit your system and, uh, and to really hold up to the biggest bass that swim. Um, we're we're going to get, I want to get your contact info out there a couple times through the, through our show. So, uh, so you are willing to make some of these modifications. Uh, I know one of your concerns I think is very well, and, and very professional on your part is that a lot of people may not realize that they don't have a lure that can be modified. So you want them to get you a picture and things like that to make sure yes. it's something you can work with. Yes, they can contact me and I'll, um, I'll guide them through that process. It's to protect me and them because unfortunately there are bad people out there and the internet attracts them. What? Yep. Where, where, are you, where are you guys meeting these people? Oh man! Oh, yeah. Go, go <laughs> into some, some classic car groups and look at the stuff they're trying to pass off. But um, but yeah, um, what I'm what I'm protecting us from uh, somebody sending me a lure that's plastic and claiming that I switched it. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, vice versa. Um, I, I want them to be sure that they're dealing with with somebody that's on the level, obviously. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. I want to get good detailed pictures of it and you know, send them to me. And so I can see the lure that's coming and they can see that that's the lure that came back. Yep. It, now, how can they reach you? What's the best way to reach out to Jimmy Zinker? I'm Jimmy Zinker on Facebook. I have two profile pages. Uh, one of them is a primary. So if I don't respond immediately, you've probably gotten on my secondary, you know, page. You can um, contact me through messenger. Also, I um, have an email. It's uh, it's jimmyzinker68 at gmail.com. Okay. We'll, so I got to we'll, we'll post those on the screen uh, in our post production effort and, and make yeah. sure we'll put that up there also again toward the end of the program because I'm sure so, there's going to be a lot of folks out there who are going to want. I have a question. Uh, I want to go back to the double hooks on the, uh, on the side of the bait with you, Jimmy. Um, I've seen where some people, and I can't remember if Brasher did this or not, but someone uh, showed some sort of a tip where you snug those hooks up against the body of the bait and wrap them tight with a uh, rubber band. It's a rubber do band. You, yep. Do you do that? I have done it in the past. I don't like it. Um, okay. The hookup ratio drops, but also the rubber bands don't stay. It's very, very aggravating. And okay. so I just frankly quit using it and just started doing the best I could without that method. Um, okay. I understand LJ used it quite a bit in the lakes around Tallahassee, Florida. Now I've got a concept that, um, and I built this bug. It's on this pole back here. I actually made this jitterbug. This is a hand carved body. 
and I made it about three nights ago. And it's made with the weedless hooks that have the wire weed guards on them. Mounted oh, wow. to the body. And like I said, this is just a concept that I'm working on. I'm going to start using it here. And uh, my only concern, I've already gone out and thrown it. And I've thrown it in weed beds. And it's exceptional in vegetation. It does not get hung up. Slides right over it. So the nice. question now is, and, and the action's beautiful. It's got a very deep tone, pop, pop, pop. It's going to work. My only question to be answered is when these fish get warm enough and start hitting it, will it hook them up and will it keep them or will they be able to throw it? Right. So yeah, it those, remains to be seen. But yeah. Yeah. Cause yeah, those hooks are solid the, the body. Yes, sir. That's how I'm trying to get away from the rubber band tactic. However, if you want to try the rubber band tactic, you just put the, the the treble hooks up next to the body and use a rubber band to hold them snugly against the side of the body and then the hook on the back you position it so that two prongs are pointing up one prong is pointing down and you take wire cutters and you cut that downward prong off and the theory is it'll slip over the vegetation that will make the jitterbug roughly 50 to 70 percent weedless but it's it's problematic it was my okay. experience. Yep. Uh, that's a tremendous coverage on the, the bait concept and, and the changes you make to, to make that classic bait better. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the conditions under which you like to throw uh, a jitterbug. You mentioned uh, that, well, traditionally when people talk about top water, they like to see water temperatures, uh, say, or, or I'd say ordinarily, they'd like to see water temperatures at least in the 60s. What about you? I agree with that. So you like like it in the 60s, uh, and and you're you're not always, but you're quite frequently fishing this bait at night. And when I think about night fishing, I think about the optimal conditions would be a, a clear water fishery. Yes, sir. How, the clear how, much the visibility, how much visibility do you feel like you need to have before it's clear enough? I prefer a minimum of three feet. If it's, if it's more stained than that, I will tend to try to find clearer water. It's not to say if you've got a muddy lake, you won't catch bass like that doing this. I just prefer the clearer water. Right. How about, um, how about you like a little chop on the water? You like it dead slick? I prefer it calm, but I, I don't get to pick how the wind's blowing. So it's just, um, you have to yeah. do it all. But optimum, I prefer it to be warm and dark, no moon, and no breeze. Just completely quiet and a lot of frogs. Time of the year? Uh, time of the year from February through October. No better oh, month? That's where you are in, in South Georgia. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. But would you say it's any time the water temperature exceeds about 60 until it falls back down below 60? Is that yes, fair? It's a 60 degree mark. You can you start getting after it. Um, he asked a question, uh, a better month. I catch them all through the warm part of the year with this tactic and this lure fishing at night, and I love doing it. The health of the fish seems to tend to be better from February through about june and june they'll start getting real skinny a lot of places right right now you you mentioned frogs um it's and you're talking about frog right? croaking a lot of frog Cro noise a lot of frog noise uh and i assume that when you're not hearing a lot of frog noise the fishing isn't too good not necessarily good no <laughs> not necessarily um but if the frogs are active they're out moving about the fish you know, in nature, they should know this is the time to, to feed if I want to feed real quick and easy. Yeah. You know, food's there. Yeah, I mean, I've noticed that in just my normal bass fishing, you know, for example, if the cows are laying down on the ground, you're not catching anything. Put a movie in the VCR, you know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, yeah, all these things hold true. I tell you, the thing about fishing at night like this and why I love it so much, and I've actually heard Pat Cullen say this, too, in a video. It, it becomes a different world at night. You will hear things that you will not hear during the day. Um, you'll see things. You're not going to see a meteor during the day. I see them yeah. all the time. You yeah. know, out on a beautiful cypress-covered, pad-covered lake, 
you know, and a meteor streaks across the sky while you're at man, it don't get no better. That's awesome. And yes. and for for anybody listening not familiar with Pat Cullen, Pat Cullen was a, a Georgia angler who uh, designed and and sold buzz baits. He was a, a night fishing guy, threw a lot of buzz baits, very, very successful at it. There is a fairly obscure but well worth watching video made uh, by Pat Cullen back around 2010 or something like that, I want to say. Uh, if mm-hmm. you can get your hands on it, it's it's well worth the watch. Uh, but he was absolutely a, a, a buzz bait nut. And, I also uh, fish his buzz baits at night. There you go. Yes, sir. There you go. But yeah. shows the jitterbug. Um, let's talk about right now. Let's talk about your gear. Um, Brasher, of course, using super heavy stuff, 50 pound braid back in the day. Uh, the mm-hmm. heaviest rod he on. Um, how about you, Jimmy? What do you, what kind of rod do you like to throw a musky jitterbug? With? It's got to be a very heavy action rod. That's my only requirement. I'm not real big on any one particular name over another one. I will typically walk through a store. And um, a lot of time, my wife is really good uh, on, with me on my hobbies. Um, I'm walking through a store. I pick up a rod and I, I hold it. And I like the balance. I love it. It's thick. It's heavy. It's you know, it's a good heavy action rod. A lot of times, she'll say, "Do you think that one will do good?" And I'll say, "Yeah." Well, so we'll get it. And um, the 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 key thing is, you've got to have a rod that you can torque back on and keep that bass from getting down in that vegetation. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and how about yeah, a real? So what, uh, Sorry, go ahead, Terry. I was going to ask: um, Are you fishing a seven foot rod, a six and a half foot rod, seven and a half foot it's, rod? I'm, this is a seven foot rod here, and this is my primary jitterbug fishing rod right now. And I have fished them as short as six foot. You know, haven't been uh-huh. made to fish the catfish with. Okay, we don't. You know, you, you're not going to find a musky rod in South Georgia down here <laughs> those are very very thick very heavy rods um i use those yeah but you can you can order them nowadays jimmy you can get on you can get yeah. online and you can and you it's can't not, feel you know, them though when you, you keep, when you're buying a rod online you can't feel the thing that, that too yeah. but it's just it's just not that important of an element to it to me um i can buy them any anywhere around here any fish and tackle place uh, as long as it's a heavy rod that's all i ask what do you like for a reel? Now, my reel is another story. Ambassador used to make a XLT Plus 85-0. They quit making them sometime back in the, I think, the mid-90s. I've got, I think, 15 or 17 of them. I buy them off of eBay. Those are the reels I use. I just always loved that reel. Um, like LJ Brasher, I torque the drag all the way down so that it doesn't give line when the fish runs. Yep. That's devotion to a reel right there. I, I like it. Uh, you, you talked a little bit about line, but uh, tell us about the line you prefer for most of your nighttime musky uh, musky jitterbug fishing. Uh, Power Pro, anywhere from sixty-five to a hundred pound test. Um, this one's got a hundred pound test on it. I okay. put it on there about August, I think it was, and basically testing it, and I like it, so I'll probably keep it on there. When I'm fishing at night, I've got six rods in my boat that are that are rigged up heavy action rods, uh, XLT plus reels, sixty five to a hundred pound test braided line. And, you know, for the same reason NASCAR doesn't bring one car to the race. Um, so unusual, I'm, I'm, I'm hard on the equipment. So a reel may go down in the middle of the night. The worm wears out. I just put it down, pick up another one. Do you find that uh, you know line size makes a difference sometimes? Not at night. Okay. Not at night. I just want it to hold. Yep. Yep. The problem with the fish seeing the line, that doesn't come into play at night when there's no moon. I've never noticed a difference, but you know, from one line to the next. Yeah. I didn't know if there was a, a different action with the bait with respect to light line, vice heavy line or, or not. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, other gear you like to have with you to make sure you've got your best chance of boating the fish of a lifetime. You're obviously always have a dip net. Gotta have a dip net. Have a dip net. Um, I have rigged up a set of LED lights on the either side of the front bow of my boat, and they're routed through one of the old. Remember the old foot 
dimmer switches that came in cars back in the seventies and prior. Yeah. For your, for your high beams. <laughs> yes, sir. It's old high beam switch. And yep. um, it's a high low beam. So you wire the lights into one side or the other, leave the other side disconnected. You've got an on off switch. So I'm playing the bass and I only do this if it's a big fish. If it's not a big fish, I, I do as little light as possible. Um, because artificial light in this scenario at night is a no, no, a trophy bass that you're looking for. She's, she didn't get old being stupid. So she knows that light don't belong. You turn that light on. She's gone. She's gone. So, Mm -hmm. um, I play the fish up next to the boat. I get my dip net. I hit that switch. The lights come on. I net her. I turn the hit switch, turn them off. Yep. So you're not using a headlamp or anything like that. I do have a headlamp. Yes, sir. I do. Okay. I, I, like I said, though, I keep it to a minimum. The mm-hmm. only time I will turn that thing on is if I've got an issue where my line is tangled and I can't see to untangle it. That and and I shade it as best I can and I keep it to a minimum. Get it on, get it off as quick as you can. Right. Now, uh, Jimmy, you and I were talking just the other day, and uh, there's a product on the market. It's only been out for a, a couple of years. It's called a Firefly. And I don't know if you had a chance to look at that website or not, but um, it casts a, it, it sits on top of your back running light in a boat when you're out at night, and it casts a really faint glow all around. Did you have a chance to look at that? Because I was curious as to whether you thought a, a light like that would be beneficial or whether it would scare the fish away. Yes, I have not. I, I'm sorry. I apologize. No, no worries. I a no worries at all. No, no I worries will at all. make a point to get to that tomorrow. Oh, not a, not a problem, man. That's not a big deal. I was just curious because well, yeah, I'm curious about it too. As a as a guy whose whose eyesight is is failing as he gets older, I'm looking for any little edge I can get. And yeah. uh, well, and you know, as we mentioned in that conversation, also though, in today's world, you've got so much light pollution that yeah. it's never totally pitch black dark. Yep, that's an excellent point. Excellent point. One of the things I've been fascinated by, Terry, is, um, and I'm not a big social media guy, but there's quite a, a bit of jitterbug social media out there. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. People who are On addicted. Facebook, is, it's crazy. And I mean, there's there's got to be no less than four uh, Arborgast uh, Facebook pages. Um, and yeah, there's they're, they're everywhere. Um, Jimmy, are you participating in any of those, any of the jitterbug oriented? Uh, I am in two of them. Um, an Arbogast group and also a, uh, one that's called jitterbug addicts. <laughs> so, I you know, a tallow then probably, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. But yeah. it's a collector's world, you know, and I'm a fisherman. What I do to the lures will make a lot of those guys cry. <laughs> well, actually, the guy that I got the, the jitterbug uh, from at the NFL CC was Italo. He's the one that sold me that $20 user. <laughs> huh. Yeah. So, yeah, I got to talk with, uh, with, with him for probably an hour. Um, you got one a good day. Eye on that. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah. And, and for, for everybody listening, uh, Jimmy is very, very ethical with regard to his purchases. He lets he lets all the sellers know that uh, the jitterbugs they sell him, with, with very few exceptions, he does collect some, but with very few exceptions, are going to be modified and put on the end of that 100-pound Power Pro. Yes, sir. So I, I admire that. I admire that a lot. Jimmy. That's, I'm that's from a collector. I tell him that's where his lure's going. And so if he doesn't want to sell it for that, I respect that because I'm a classic car guy. I've got old Camaros, and I would never sell one of my cars if I knew it was going on a racetrack. There you go. There you go. Uh, and, and, Jimmy, I want to tell everybody about uh, something that's coming up here pretty soon. Uh, Jimmy Zinker and I are working on a, a feature article uh, about the jitterbug a little about its history, how Jimmy fishes it, how he modifies it and so forth. So uh, if you're a bass member, be on the lookout for that. that that'll be coming maybe sometime toward the early summer, something like that. But but we're working on that article. Uh, Jimmy, it's been a delight to interview you about that and to talk with you about that and see all the things you do to these baits to make uh, what what has been the, the best trophy bass bait in history even better. Thank you. And it's an honor to do it. Now, I, I, once again, I want to say thank you for that. Uh, absolutely. My pleasure. 
Uh, Terry, uh, any more questions for Jimmy? I mean, this has been, I, I think, very enlightening on how to fish this bait and the things he does to make the bait better. I, I, I don't think I have. I mean, I, I'd like to go fishing with Jimmy. You know? You're welcome many times. <laughs> that would be awesome. I Maybe promise you'll I won't more than once. I, I promise I won't quit on you. <laughs> <laughs> I may pass out for 15 minutes, but <laughs> I won't quit. <laughs> and I'll bet you in his garage, Jimmy, that Terry's got exactly a great outfit for throwing that bait. I guarantee you. Oh yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's just not it's not that difficult. It's just it's such a grueling way to do it if you're not accustomed to staying up at night. And you know, there's some people. Um, when I first got into this, I was a police officer, you know, and I would work all night. So on the graveyard shift, we would work five on and four off, and I'd have to try to keep my system on that night schedule. So this was the perfect way to do it. It was um it was right down my alley. You know, but now 40 years later and I'm not doing that anymore. And I'm accustomed to going to bed at nine o'clock with my wife and getting up with her at six o'clock. And yeah. it's hard to stay up all night now. <laughs> it requires coffee, but I, I, it's worth it because I love doing it. And, you know, this, this tactic of fishing, if you want to do this, this is a great opportunity to catch a trophy bass that you've dreamed about. The thing is, you're after the rare, the exceptional. It's not uncommon for me to fish on a lake all night long for just five or six blowups, and that's a really good night. This is not where you're going to go out there and catch 12 or 14 dinks. You know, this is a slow thing. You're going to cast and reel, cast and reel, cast and reel. But when and I that apologize, yeah. Happens, I want to go back to that a little bit. Thank you for bringing that up again. We didn't really go into the cadence that you prefer for the musky jig. Yeah, that's true. Take us through uh, a standard retrieve, your rod position, and stuff like that. So I screwed up. We're we're at, we're backtracking now. <laughs> your imagination is the limit. Um, most of the time, I'm throwing it and pulling it. It's like a crankbait. Um, but the thing about the jitterbug, it's so versatile. You can pop it along, make it hop like a frog across the top of the water. You can walk the dog with it like a czar spook. You can uh, do a stop and go retrieve. And a lot of times these bigger bass, they'll get on this thing. And man, I love it when this happens. I also hate it when it happens. She'll get on this thing and she'll follow it back to you. They're less spooky at night. They'll swim right up to the boat. And just as you go to pick this lure up, just pardon me, but all hell breaks loose. I mean, the night goes from dead calm to you, you just about lose your rod. They'll snatch it out of your hand because you're using such heavy braided line. It don't stretch. And right. she's just suddenly there. And they, yes. they will do that. that. That's real common at night to follow it to the boat and hit it. Just as she thinks this is my last opportunity, it's getting away. And she'll yeah. mess. You, you, you got a defibrillator about, on your boat? Oh, sure. Lord. Yeah. Pat <laughs> Cullen used to say it's not for those with heart problems. Right. <laughs> no. And yeah, exactly. Uh, well, uh, you know, you talk about, you know, most people I think think of a jitterbug and especially fishing a jitterbug at night as something where uh, that steady retrieve that maximizes the noise of the lure is going to yep. be your go-to. Is, is that fair? That That is it. The vast majority of the time, my rod's held up uh, roughly 9, 10 o'clock off the water. Um, as the lure gets closer to the boat, I will generally lower my rod. And then as the lure is getting right up to the boat, my rod is just off the surface of the water. Are you covering much water when you're fishing with a jitterbug at night, Jimmy? Or are you, are you layering casts in the same area? I move very slowly, very quietly. Um, this one particular lake that I've taken up fishing this past summer, and it's a very good lake, 1,000 acres, nothing but lily pads and moss. And, wow. um, deepest place in it that I've found is roughly eight foot deep. And I've got a 12 foot wooden pole and I just push my boat around through that stuff. Just real quiet and kind of fan, you know, fish from left to right. Um, always listen. You'll hear fish moving. Bass makes a very distinct sound when she feeds at night. So if you will listen, if there's fish moving, a lot of times they'll be moving in one particular area. So you want to be able to hear them and, and know when you hear them and go to them. 
Are well, you, so that uh, brings up another question. Um, do you catch more than one fish out of a small area, or does catching a fish spook the others? Uh, I'm fishing for bigger fish with a bigger lure. I very rarely catch numerous fish in a quick sequence. Not saying it doesn't happen, but very rarely, especially with the bigger ones. So the answer to that question is no. I, I think... I think when I catch one fish, the other fish know that something's wrong. They will calm down at least for a little while. Okay. But the, I'm going to tell you that, you know, we hear the legend, um, LJ Brasher catching 10 double, I mean, five double digit fish in one night at Lake Jackson. Um, I think I've caught two sevens in a night, but I've never done anything like what, you know, what the legends are that he did. Yeah, that was Jackson back at a time when it was clear, pretty clearly the best trophy bass lake in the world. Yep. And uh, and although it got some fishing pressure, certainly, um, it probably didn't get a lot of night pressure. And, you know, that that's true of, of a lot of Florida waters and maybe some South Georgia waters, too, because we have these things. Y'all y'all probably heard of them. Uh, they're called alligators. Yes, sir. And, and I cannot imagine throwing one of these for very long without being interrupted very rudely by an alligator. What, what do yes, you do in that situation, Jimmy? I've got two jitterbugs with alligator teeth holes in the body. Um, I bet. Yep. And one of them is from Miccosukee, where Brasher used to fish. And that's another thing, too. Florida grossly overregulates these things. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot more alligators now than when Brasher was in his in his. Oh, yeah. Home. Yeah. And I think that may be what's cut down on the numbers of large fish. Also, these things have got to compete for food because there's so many of them. Lake Miccosukee is infested. You go out there and turn your, um, you turn your flashlight on at Lake Miccosukee at night. And it literally looks like a Christmas tree out there. Just eyeballs. A lot of red yeah. eyeballs. Uh, everywhere. So typically I what I do is, um, I use a flashlight. And I'll scan the lake real quick with that flashlight, and I'll make a mental picture of where I saw those eyeballs, and I fish away from them. Ironically, Brasher said the best waters he fished always had an alligator in them. Is and that alligator. your experience? Uh, one or yeah. more, he would say. One yep. or two, usually. And, and Is that your experience yep. as well? Yes, sir. I agree with him. He said it shows that the lake didn't dry up the year before. Gotcha. It was um it was necessary uh, that the lake had an alligator. Yeah, but, I'm not sure I agree with him about that because you know during the mating season those gators cover some cover some territory. Right. Yep. But uh, I, I guess if uh if a lake dried up the year before it wouldn't have a lot for an alligator to eat maybe when it came back, but uh so it wouldn't keep a gator for long. But yeah, I I just um you you made these wonderful modifications to these jitterbugs that that i have here and I'm, I'm almost afraid to throw them for fear of of losing them to a big lizard well, I'll, modify I'll modify them for you again it's it's not a problem <laughs> you really do it. i agree I, I need them i need them to catch giant bass 10 plus and and somehow magically avoid alligators <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't know what that modification is but if you can do that man i mean if it weren't for the bad times brother we wouldn't enjoy the good times there's a that's a fine point i got no argument for that <laughs> yep well all right folks uh one more time jimmy on how folks can can reach out to you and and find out if they've got a, a jitterbug that can be modified and uh or if you can sell them a jitterbug or modify them a jitterbug how's the best way to reach you um jimmy zinker 68 at gmail.com or you can get me on messenger through my through my Facebook pages. You'll know them when I see them. I think I've got big fish on the cover photos on both of them right now, but I change them pretty regular. Yep. That's yep. fantastic. Terry, anything else before we, uh, no, sir. Wrap no, this one pretty up? much. Yep. Well, yep. all right, Jimmy, thank you so much for your time, man. You are a fabulous guest, a, a wealth of knowledge it. encyclopedia on the jitterbug. We can't tell you how much we appreciate it and have enjoyed the show tonight. Thank you so much for having me. Can I say one quick thing? Of yeah, course. Absolutely. I have had countless unforgettable nights over the last 40 years because Mr. LJ Brasher shared his knowledge and a 21 year old boy read it. And here I am 40 years later. Um, and I'm grateful to Mr. Phillips and LJ for that. And so I just wanted to say that that's why I'm doing this. I'm, I'm, I'm paying it forward, so to speak. Awesome. We, we appreciate that. 
and I, I'm sure our, the audience appreciates that too. And I bet you get a, a lot of folks reaching out to you who, who want to catch their personal best and think that you've got a great path to that. So yep. give it a try. It's thrill, you know, and once I, once I do one for you, you don't have to pay me again. You can modify your own after that because you'll be able to see what I did. <laughs> yep. That is fantastic. Cool. Jimmy Zinker. Thank you so much. Thank yes, you, sir. We appreciate you. Take care. Take care. Dr. That Batista, was amazing. That was, that was a lot awesome. of fun. Oh yeah, um, it was. Uh, I've had a chance, of course, because I'm working on that, that Bassmaster magazine article to, to visit with yep. Jimmy quite a bit lately. And, and the modifications he's made to my baits are, are astonishing. And, you know, yeah. as bass fishermen, I think we're in the habit of changing lures. Whatever comes out of the box is not nearly good enough to tie on and throw. Exactly. But it isn't, it isn't very often that you can look at a lure and say objectively, yes, this is better than it was. And, yeah. and with what Jimmy does, it, it is clear this is better than the original. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I can just tell by looking at it that that thing's going to chug a heck of a lot better. Um, you know, it, it always kind of uh, messed with my head, you know, and it wasn't just with the jitterbug, but it was with, you know, Zara Spook, the size of the screws that they would put in to those baits. And that just always scared the heck out of me that they're not going to hold if I catch a really big fish on this. Right. You know, and uh, to hear that he put, I mean, the size of screws that he's putting in there, there's no way they're going to come out. So, well, one thing I'm really excited about is, you know, now that we've done this show and the other jitterbug show too, which was a lot of fun. Uh, and I know what a skilled woodworker you are. I know you're going to make me a bunch of aromatic cedar jitterbugs. Uh, only I need better. to buy a lathe. I need to buy a lathe. That's what I need to get. Um, that's one of the tools that I do not have in my wood shop and, uh, gotta fix that. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's one of those things. Oh, I don't want to turn wood. I don't want to turn in chair lay or, you know, uh, table legs. Oh, I don't like round table legs. I like round jitter bugs. <laughs> yeah. And, and so. you know, I, my apologies to Mr. Arbogast, the late, great Fred Arbogast, but this doesn't look that tough to make in terms of the body. No, the body would be simple to make. Um, you know, the the thing that would be a little bit more difficult would be to make the faceplate. Uh, yeah, that that looks know. problematic. You got to stamp yeah. that out and bend it, and it's not going to be real easy. Uh, Jimmy has a system for for doing that, and it, it, his 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 faceplates are remarkably symmetrical. The the bend. Yeah. Now, it. did that bait? come with three screws holding the face plate in or did it only have two to begin with i, I know a lot remember. of the bugs only had two i think these had i think the musky jitterbugs have three. three okay and i know that i know that um there's been variations on the orientation of the screws through the mm -hmm. years uh i know that he replaced the screws in these baits with, yeah. with longer, more sturdy screws, but I couldn't tell you exactly. I don't think he drilled a new hole to add screws to the faceplate. And I, okay. I call it the lip. I, I always hesitate to call it the lip. To me, it, it's a yeah. Plate. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, you know, it's uh, it, it is not a, a lip is what's on a crankbait. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, uh, yeah. but but these have, these baits have always fascinated me. I've always been intrigued by the jitterbug. I've caught a lot of fish on a jitterbug in my life, mostly unfortunately as a kid and fishing yeah. in the daytime, but yep. it's a, it's an amazing bait for my money. It is the greatest big bass lure of all time ever, Not ever, which is similar to all time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Dr. Battisti, your takeaway on, uh, I, on I think it was great. You know, to, I mean, it was great to have Jason on that first episode that we did. Yes, uh, absolutely. And, uh, but it's it's really cool to talk to someone that that was a disciple of L.J. Brasher and actually took what he wrote and applied it and has fished that way for forty years and has you know he may not have a double digit fish but holy mackerel I mean the the the, the fish between seven and you know almost ten pounds seven and nine uh, twelve yeah yeah uh, that, that's impressive and it still works you know. I guarantee you, if you want to get a big fish, try fishing at night. 
Um, and, and if you're going to fish at night, try throwing the jitterbug. Just don't screw the prices up on eBay any more than they are. Oh, <laughs> well, I think between the two shows we've done on the musky jitterbug and the Bassmaster article that Jimmy and I are working on, I think it's going to, I would not be surprised if it doesn't double the price of, yeah. of, of, of baits to fish with. Like Terry got, got a great jitterbug recently for 20 bucks. I wouldn't yep. be surprised if that doesn't jack the price up to 40 on those and that's that's unfortunate that's the bad news the good news is um you, you can build one of your own you can call terry batisti and say terry i'm a regular <laughs> viewer of the big bass podcast therefore you owe me a half yeah. dozen musky jitterbugs <laughs> i think that's yeah. only fair well I'll, i want to give my takeaway too real quick it, um you know the wooden musky jitterbugs from the 40s until 1980 I think they're the Stradivarius violins of the fishing world, Terry. I think the, you know, the Stradivari family in Italy made violins in the 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, and they're generally considered to be some of the finest musical instruments ever made. Yep. Only about, I checked and only about 650 of those Stradivari made instruments survive. And of course they sell for millions of dollars, tremendously coveted. And although Arbogast sold conservatively tens of millions of jitterbugs <laughs> through the decades only a, a very small percentage of them were aromatic cedar musky jitterbugs as a result they're you know he, jimmy said they're pretty easy to find i think that might change on us here and, and they can be pricey and, yeah. and even though we're only reaching a few thousand listeners i am expecting this show to drive those prices higher sorry about that but maybe there's a bright side yeah. Maybe there's a bright side. If there's enough demand, if these always shows look up, on the bright side of life. <laughs> thank you, Monty Python, uh, life of Brian. Um, th there may be a bright side here, and that is if there's enough demand. If these shows get enough attention among serious trophy anglers, uh, maybe maybe it'll convince Pradco, today the parent company of Arbogast, to put the mm -hmm. lure back into production as a wood bait, even if it retails for 30, 40, 50 bucks. I yeah. think that'd be great. And, yep. and if not Pradco, maybe some other company's going to do it. Because Lee Sisson, go get, we'll talk to Lee in winter. Got to get Lee out of retirement. He would be, <laughs> yeah. he'd be the best to do it, uh, or one yep. of the great ones to do it. Uh, he worked mostly in balsa, but Lee, aromatic cedar. Um, yep. But if not Pradco, maybe some other company, because the design patents that Fred Arbogast got in the 40s expired decades ago. Exactly. You know, yep. there are some there are some lure types out there nowadays that are similar in some ways to the classic musky jitterbug. Yeah. Crawler baits. And uh, I've got some in my garage. I know Terry's got some. Crawler baits have become oh, extremely popular in Japan. And and they've been around since you know, crawler baits, Terry, have been around since at least 1940, which is about the same time as the jitterbug, um, because the old head and crazy crawler. Came out in yep. 1940, um, and they make a sound and have an action that's pretty similar to the musky jitterbug, but they're not the musky <laughs> jitterbug made out of aromatic. And here's the jitterbug type lure that I got in Australia. There you go. Uh, it's it's shaped like a mouse, but it has a jitterbug, a, a Lexan jitterbug lip on it, or you know faceplate, whatever you want to call it, and then. Ken's talking about the crawler. This is a Japanese crawler bait that that I got, she's 20 years ago. Um, absolutely beautiful. Um, so, yeah. They have a we similar some, action. Yep. We'll get but someone else to, to start making them. Yeah, I'd love to see somebody making the jitterbug again. Yeah. Uh, that would make me happy. That would excite me. Um uh, because there is a reason this bait caught all those giant fish for so many decades. There's a reason that that bait caught the Rhode Island record in 2016. It works. Yep. It's a timeless yep. design. And, uh, and guys like uh, the late LJ Brasher and our guest Jimmy Zinker, they found a way to make the bait even better. So kudos to them. Exactly. How about we slam the door on this one, Doctor? Yeah, it's time to slam the door on this episode of the Big Bass Podcast. Thank you for joining us. 
We know your time is precious, and uh, we appreciate you spending some of it with us. Uh, if you enjoyed the show, uh, please subscribe uh, and uh, you know hit the like button. Uh, and if you can do us a big favor, uh, please recommend the show to just one of your friends. If we can get you to get one person to sign up, we would instantaneously double our following. Um, and that would be a, a huge thing for us. So if you'd like to contact us, you can reach us at Ken at the big bass podcast.com, Terry at the big bass podcast.com and Nathan at the big bass podcast.com. Uh, please join us again soon. We'll bring you another story about a big bass that you cannot and will not find anywhere else. And Ken, what do they need to remember? Size matters. Amen.